Hello. Hi, welcome to the second of the Ihaka lecture series for this year. Tonight we're very lucky to have Luke Turney as the speaker. Um, Luke, is it on? Okay. Apparently it's on. <laughs> um, Luke's a professor at the University of Iowa. Um, which I don't know if you've thought about this, but this is a very brutal early hour of the morning for him to be up and talking. We're lucky to have had Luke here a number of times to visit, um, including quite an extended stay that he had here. My first encounter with Luke's work was actually about 1988 or 1989, I think with the first software that I remember him releasing, which I think was called iViews, which was an interactive graphics component that could be accessed, I think, from S at the time. Um, since then, of course, Luke has gone on and is very well known for xlispstat, or lispstat, as it became, um, which was a very important work and showed the benefits of combining a computing language with interactive graphics and showing the sorts of things you could do as a result of that. Um, not just a computer language system, but an extensible system. As well as work on his own project, uh, um, Luke has been a very significant contributor to R for a, a long, long time. He was one of the very first people that we had join up to work on R. Um, in the old, old days, we used to maintain a mailing list for anyone who was interested in R, and I can remember we got quite excited when we got more than 10 people who were interested in R. And I can remember Robert coming in one morning, very excited, saying, you should see who signed up on the mailing list last night. Um, and that was Luke. And it was very much a matter of fishing for minnows and catching a whale at the time. Um, Luke's been a very significant contributor to R uh, for a long time. Um, and a lot of people probably aren't aware of how important his work has been to the things that they do every day when they work with R. The first thing I remember him working on was the memory management and garbage collection system. Uh, which replaced the sort of half-assed amateur thing that I had implemented initially and still stands there as a very secure foundation for an awful lot of um, computation. He since added the idea of reference counting to that to avoid copying that's going on. Um, he implemented the namespace control system, um, which is very useful for organizing larger computing systems, so things like packages and so on. And finally, the most interesting thing probably is the bytecode compiler, given that R is a very compiler-hostile system. Um, it's important to have a compiler like that working and providing speed-ups for an awful lot of code. All of these things make R a much more pleasant and useful experience than it would have been otherwise. Uh, so thank you, Luke, for that. Tonight, Luke's going to be speaking on implementation of a pipe operator in R. Um, and it's always interesting to see what he has to say. So over to you, Luke. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, it's a great honor to be able to speak in this, this section. And, and it's really wonderful to have, have you as, as the chair. And thank you for that introduction. Not sure about the whale part. Um, well, never mind. Um, I, I wish I was in the um, in Auckland. It's one of my favorite places in the world, and it wouldn't be 1:30 in the morning, of course. Um, but here we are. So, um, pipe operators in R. Um, start out with, of course, R is a language for working with data, and when you work with data, you typically have to go through steps like data import, cleaning the data, um, reshaping and transforming and things of that sort, visualization, repeat, um, 
the forward pipe operator is something that helps organize this kind of a workflow, uh, helps connect up, up um, the most common form that's been used in R for an, and been prominent in R for a number of years is, is the McGritter pipe, which has this percent, greater percent notation. Uh, it was introduced around 2014. Um, recently, um, several of the current R core and several Tidyverse team members and um, uh, others worked on putting a somewhat simplified but still very effective version of a forward pipe operator into base R. And this the first version came out with uh, 4.1 in last year. Um, and this was some evolution with a 4.2 release this year. And there's a few more things uh, in, in, in the works, maybe one smallish thing for, for the next, probably for the next release. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, forward pipe operators in R and other languages, why they're, they're useful and, and some of the thinking behind why it made sense to put one into base R and do it in a particular way that we did. So why are pipes useful? Um, the basic idea of what this forward pipe operator does is provide an alternative to nested function calls. Um, Simple example of a nested function call is something like this. You plug X into F, that result goes to G, the result then goes on to H. Um, many find thinking about and reasoning about this and thinking about what did I compute first, second, and so on, a bit more confusing than it ideally should be because the computation is you do the F computation, then the G computation, then the H computation, but the order in which it shows up in the code is, is the other way around. Um, put it another way, if you read something like this, you kind of have to read it and write it from the inside out. If you're, if you're going to debug each step, it's you write the F of X, check that, then you go back and surround it with a G and, and so on. It gets harder if you have to pass on additional arguments um, that basically modify what F does and what G does and so on. And that's pretty much always necessary in, 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 uh, in our code, except for very trivial situations. Um, so here's an example of a, of, a, of a piece of code where I'm using the, some functions from the dplyr package on the New York City flights data. Um, for, for 2013 and picking out the, the flights that go from New York City to Chicago's O'Hare Airport and computing the, the monthly average delay. So this is a nested um, call version of it. Okay, but when you start reading it, the first step is you pick out the flights that go to O'Hare, then the next step is you apply a grouping operation to identify the, the different months these flights belong to. Um, finally, you do the summarization. So I worked my way out uh, to the, the final step and the, the modifier arguments for the summarization or the, actually the things that I'm computing are separated from what I'm doing by the intermediate processing of the data. Um, so reading it is inside out, developing is kind of inside out as, as well. So what a forward pipe operator does, uh, if it takes an expression like this and lets you write it, and I'm using the notation of the base pipe as we have it, have it now in R, um, you, you can write this like this. So X gets passed into F, the result gets passed into G, it's passed into H. It's kind of the way the computation happens and that's the way you often want to think about it. Um, if you want to think about what's happening or a way of thinking about what's happening is you take the first bit and the X goes into F is implicitly translated by taking the left-hand side result and putting it in as the first argument uh, to the F. Uh, so basically this bit is just transformed to an f of x and if we do that in the pipeline we take the original version that has three steps to it 
and the first one's taken care of by forming the f of x. Now we do the same thing again. And the next step, put the f of x result into the g and the um, finally the, 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 uh, uh, the last step moves the g of f in, into h. That's what happens in the evaluation process. Um, and you can think of that as basically a translation of the pipe from this form into that nested nested call. If I want to look at the that simple flights to Chicago example, um, this is what it would look like done with with a pipe. Um, there's the filter step followed by the grouping step, and you can see the argument that modifies exactly what are we grouping on, and then the summarization where the things we're calculating are right there in with a summary. So things are grouped together and it's a nice linear uh, form like that. Um, so forward pipe operators allow you to express operations in the order in which they're carried out rather than that nested form. And the additional arguments appear together with the operations. Um, it's fairly natural to write this kind of thing if you're debugging this in stages, you would start with just the first bit. I would at least check it out in my IDD, IDE, just recall that um, uh, previous expression, add a next pipe stage to it, do it again. And, and that works well for me to write the code. And also if I'm doing this in class, showing students how to do it, it's a nice, uh, nice flow, much nicer than having to write the second step around the first step and then the third step around the second step. There are other ways of reducing the, the nesting. Um, one is to use temporary variables. So if we did that in this example, we'd start with, again, computing the, uh, uh, filtering the flights down to the ones going to, to Chicago. Um, then we take that temp temporary result and, and group it to get a new temporary result. Then we'd apply the summarization. Um, it, it works, um, but this is a lot noisier. There's a lot more stuff that's kind of extraneous with those variable names. Um, in this case, I just picked TMP. Um, if I wanted to pick something meaningful, good variable names are hard to come by, which is why I use X and TMP so much. Um, you can use a temporary like this, but Inevitably, I'll end up having, oh yeah, I want to keep that one and then I stomp on it. Other people may be better at it. So it works, but it's not ideal. Um, this is something that you can see in our code, but it's something that people come, come across in, in many functional, functional oriented, mostly functional languages that yes, in principle, you can use nested calls for all sorts of things, but if you actually want to get things done, it's nice to have a pipe operator. Um, and uh, that, so the, the basic idea that, that goes across languages is you've got a left-hand side computation, an operator that says, feed that forward, pass it forward into side computation that uses the result. Um, the details will vary from language to language. Um, the first language that introduced this idea seems to have been um, a, a dialect of, of the ML language, a functional language uh, called Isabel ML in the, the mid 90s. Um, but many languages have followed. Um, F sharp, which is a functional language for use in the .NET framework, supports a pipe operator. Um, Julia does, uh, Elixir is another language. Um, JavaScript and TypeScript have been working on incorporating one for a couple of years. I'm not actually quite sure where they are on it, but the, the discussion which is linked uh, here, um, if these slides are made available, um, is, is kind of interesting and it, it, and it seems to be typical of a lot of languages and that they're sort of very strong purists and seem to think that, well, there's nothing wrong with nested calls, but people who want to get work done really prefer having the option of having a type operator available, even if it isn't the most pure uh, 
uh, kind of thing that, that you, you might have. In terms of implementing this idea, there seem to be more or less two approaches in, in across the languages. Um, the conceptually simplest one is that the right-hand side is an expression that produces a function of one argument, a unary function. And all the pipe expression means is compute the left-hand side value and pass it to the right-hand side function. Uh, that's basically what Julia does, what F-sharp does. The other approach treats the um, right-hand side as an expression takes the left-hand side and inserts it into that expression and then evaluates the result. Um, that's what the R pipes uh, do and that's what the Elixir language, for example, does. Um, so the first approach is really quite simple, but it's really, in, in its pure form, deals only with functions that take a single argument. So if you, in R, we always need these additional arguments, like in the flights example. Um, <clears throat> if you want to handle that, you either need to do something like create an anonymous function that puts in those additional arguments, or have some kind of language level support that addresses this. Um, if you're using anonymous functions, it actually can also lead to some syntactic surprises. I'll, I'll mention one a little, a little later. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the second approach, which is just, you think of it as a substitution, you take the right hand, the yeah, right hand side and insert the left hand side and then evaluate. You need some mechanism or convention for where do you put the left hand side result. There's implicit conventions, like what's used in most cases in the McGritter pipe and the, um, the new base pipe, is to put the left-hand side as the first argument of the function, followed by whatever other arguments there might be listed explicitly. So it's an implicit first argument approach. Some languages do it last argument. Um, the other option is an explicit designation using a placeholder. Um, you know, McGritter uses a dot, but it's optional in some cases. Uh, underscore is used by a number of languages. Percent sign is, uh, is, is used by a number. Um, <clears throat> the, the Elixir language, one reason I mention it is, is that it does what the McGritter pipe does, implicitly moving, putting the uh, left-hand side result in as the first argument of the function implicitly. Um, as the base pipes do. Um, you should mention uh, Unix pipes. They uses the word pipe. Um, people sometimes superficially say that, well, the pipe in R is like, there's a superficial similarity. And of course, Unix pipes have been along for, around for much longer than these, these functional language forward pipe operators. But, they're really, it's really a different kind of animal. Um, the, the Unix pipe, you have a process, you pipe its result into another process. Um, the left-hand side processes output stream is connected to the input stream of the right-hand side process. And it's a stream processing idea. The two processes, the producer and the consumer can be running concurrently. The, consuming right-hand side starts reading data as soon as anything's available. The left-hand side can keep producing more data and it gets picked up when it's when, when the right-hand side is ready. Um, you know, the left-hand side potentially can be generating an infinite stream of data and the right-hand side just picks up what it wants until it's done and then stops. So it's very different in that sense. Okay, um, that's a bit of general background. Um, now, in terms of R, there's a, a pretty nice um, blog post that uh, Adolfo Alvarez um, posted four or five years ago originally, but updated last year on the evolution of, of pipes in R. Um, and according to that post, the starting point that you can identify for the idea 
is a, a post um, by an anonymous user in, in, in Stack Overflow asking about whether the F sharp pipe, which is one of the simple one single right hand side produces a single argument function uh, idea pipes that um, it's, so it's a simpler implementation. Uh, can you make that happen in R? And um, same day, Ben Bolker replied with a simple solution which you can make simpler still and, and write just like this. So I, I picked a slightly similar notation here um, with, with a percent operator. Um, it's a function two arguments, a left-hand side value and a right-hand side function. And all it does is apply the function to the value. That's conceptually all, all that's involved. It works fine for single argument functions here. I'm just taking the log and then exponentiating again. Um, now, again, we almost always want in, in things like the flights example to be using additional arguments. F sharp and a number of other functional languages that, that use this approach support an idea of partial application. Um, so basically, if you if you pass only one argument to a function that can take through two, that produces a new function taking only that additional argument. And th that leads to, you, you don't need anything else to be able to handle multiple arguments. Um, we don't have that in R and it's it's just sufficiently different from kinds of things you could do with R. It's, it's not realistic even think about adding it. So the option in R really is to create, if you're forced to use single argument functions on the right-hand side, the only real option is to work with anonymous functions. Um, so um, again, taking that flights data example, um, you can write a function of one argument that does the filtering with the incoming data, same thing with the grouping, same thing with the summarization. Um, it's pretty noisy uh, as, as syntax. The, the, even without the red highlighting, that function takes up a lot of visual space, a lot of attention away from the part that's really going on. You can use the recently introduced shorthand. And one reason it was introduced was to reduce the noise level, but it's still pretty noisy. Um, A number of variations, more sophisticated variations on the pipe were proposed over the next couple of years. Um, but the, and the, if you want more detail, look, look, look at uh, the, uh, the blog post that I, um, that I linked to. Um, the Magritter pipe um, is the one that really uh, caught on uh, and um, has, has now become quite widely, widely used. Uh, the earliest version, at least if I'm reading this correctly, required a, an explicit placeholder, a dot. Um, so with that version, you would write the flights example uh, like this. The first step, the flights argument is passed as the first argument via the dot. Second step, the result of the filter is passed via the dot to the grouping and, and so on. Um, Fairly quickly, the decision was made to make that dot optional if it's in the first position. So we're now using an implicit passing of the first argument. Um, this works very well for what some people come to call pipe-friendly functions, ones that take operate on data frames but take the data frame as their first argument. Um, pretty much all of the tidyverse is designed that way. There are a good number of base for R functions designed that way as well, but there are many that aren't. Maybe LM is the prime example. You take a linear model, the first argument is a formula and data comes after that. Okay, so that's the background. And so the McGritter pipe uh, is, is uh, what had, had become pretty much the mainstay. And it was, it is very, still very, very successful. Um, there are some issues. Um, Leonel Henry has a, a blog post in 2016 on 
a number of different things. Uh, and one section is on the pipe uh, and the Margritter pipe. And um, some of the things that he points out is, is that because of the processing that happens at runtime, stack traces, when there's an error, are more complex than they need to be. You have a lot of pipe plumbing, if you will, uh, in there. This has been cleaned up a little bit, but it's still more than, than you would like. Um, there's also, because the processing of the, of the pipe happens at runtime, um, some computational overhead. Um, it's not going to matter if the data sets are reasonably large, but if you were to use pipes and small data sets in a loop, it would matter. Um, another aspect is there that the McGritter pipe has acquired a number of fancier features um, that uh, are certainly useful in, in some cases, but they add some complexity that if you're describing the pipe, you have to make sure you document them. And if you're maintaining it, you have to make sure you don't break them. Um, they're not used very much. So simple being able to have something that's a little simpler to maintain was was a uh, was a, a, a something to think about. Um, so the point we came to is that the concept of a pipe is has become pretty well established both in R and other other languages of a forward pipe operator. Um, and so, the question was, should we think about taking this as thinking of it as a core feature that should be available in the base language? That way, it wouldn't require an additional package for someone who wants to, to use it. Um, and, and that has some advantages. Um, and also provide an opportunity to maybe clean up some of the issues and, and just simplify things a little bit by just focusing on what has really turned out to be um, the most useful features of it. Um, the idea of, of putting something in, in uh, R was, was probably first brought forward by, by several of the, of the Tidyverse uh, team, um, Lionel Henry, Jim Hester, Hadley Wickham. Um, and uh, what we have now, um, is basically a result of a collaboration between a few of us in the R core group and those folks in the Tidyverse team in particular and several other people in the R community who contributed, Duncan Murdoch in particular contributed quite a, quite a bit. Um, so let's look at what we have in 4.1, which was released last year. Um, started with, the, the, the most common use pattern for the McGritter pipe is the implicit first argument use. Um, if you work with tidyverse, you can get away almost never using the dot placeholder. Um, yeah, I've been teaching for a couple of years and I'm pretty sure in tidy, with tidyverse, and I'm pretty sure I don't use it anywhere in my notes. Um, It's, it's not a perfect idea um, for a number of reasons. Um, one of which is that in R, the idea of what is the first argument becomes a little fuzzy since we can use named arguments in various positions. So what is the first argument in an expression, in a call expression, isn't necessarily the first argument in the function definition when you start putting <coughs> named arguments in the call expression. But nevertheless, um, if we want something that we put into base to be reasonably widely adopted, and there's no reason to do it if, if that's not the goal, it made sense to stick with what people are familiar with from the McGritter framework, unless it was absolutely necessary to go in a different direction or there's really compelling arguments. <clears throat> so, for that reason, we stuck with the, and, and started with the implicit first argument idea, which I showed in the earlier examples using of the base pipe. Um, 
When you're doing that implicit substitution, if you, if you remember back to when I sort of walked through what um, X goes into F, goes into G, goes into H, um, or X, then G, uh, then F, then G, then H, uh, in the translation, <clears throat> you can think of processing this just as a syntax transformation. And that is, in fact, the reasonable, at least a possible way to implement it. Idea was was suggested first by uh, Lionel, uh, Henry, and Jim Hester, uh, and these are links to their um, uh, GitHub uh, um, uh, uh, repos that that have um, chain changes that that can be made to the grammar to to make this this work out. <clears throat> so this is the approach that we went with in the. Um, in R4.1 and, and forward. So what this does is here, I've, I've written the code that I showed earlier, the simple code, for, um, X pipes into F, result pipes into G, pipes into H, um, as a string. And if you parse that string using the parse function, it just produces the nested call. And so, um, there's no runtime over again because in evaluating this, because the pipe has been transformed away, there's no additional runtime layers that confuse tracebacks. So error handling and reporting and analysis is, is, is much simpler. Um, this isn't the first time something has been done this way. Uh, one other uh, example is the write assignment operator. If you write compute something like the log of two and the right arrow assigning it into a variable X. And you look at what that, how that is parsed, it turns out it's just turned at parse time into a left, an ordinary left assignment. It may be more convenient to write it this way, but it's translated immediately to, to that form. Um, okay, um, now, as simple as the idea of stick it in the first argument is, since everything in R is a function, including things like for loops, while loops, it can lead to some weirdness um, if, if, if you aren't a little bit. Looking at the McGritter pipe, which doesn't guard against this thing, this, this sort of thing, if you were to pipe a value into a for loop, you get an error, but it's not particularly easily understood error. Um, nobody would be likely to want to do that. This is something you might actually think about trying to think about, well, what might this do? Piping something into an anonymous function. Um, and you know, for example, in F sharp or in Julia, this kind of thing would work. Um, again, the, the, the answer is a little bit, the, the error is a little bit uh, inscrutable. Um, it's the result of just, okay, function is a function, we'll just stick something in and it produces something that makes no sense. If I do the same sort of thing with, a, with an if expression, I don't get an error. It's the, it's, it does not evaluating it produces a result. It's not a result that makes a whole lot of sense, um, but um, um, there's no error throw. Now, again, except for maybe the function thing that you might want to try, nobody is really likely to write this sort of thing on purpose, but you've got a bigger code base, you accidentally delete or add a brace or parentheses somewhere, you can end up with this embedded in your code, you run it and you get an error that you just can't figure out because it's not really pointing you in the right direction or you get no error, just a result that makes no sense. So to be careful about this, what we decided to do with the base pipe parser is to signal an error it to basically only allow standard functions on the right-hand side, not syntactically special ones. 
So with these things, all those, all those three examples, you get an error that's at least reasonably understandable. Um, <clears throat> you can't you do that on the right-hand side, all three of those. Um, <clears throat> Now, for now, because it's easy, we just ruled out all syntactically special things. There are some where it might make sense to permit them. Uh, in particular, the ones that the number of folks have asked about now it probably makes sense is the, uh, <clears throat> the extractor functions, the single and double square brackets and the dollar and the, and the at sign. Um, you, these are things, if you use them, you have to use them with the back quote. And that makes anything you do with them a little less readable already. Uh, so there may be other, uh, other approaches, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in, in a little bit. So 4.1, released last year, included this and only the this the, this simple implicit first argument uh, based base pipe, which works very well. Called pipe friendly functions, ones that take their data frame argument as the first argument. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Hadley's been working. Uh, Hadley Wickham's been working on a, a second edition of the R for Data Science book and is now converted that to use the base pipe. And uh, the tweet he sent um, earlier this year, we mentioned that it was surprisingly easy to do the conversion. There was just a small number of cases where something sp more, the gritter specific was used and, and that wasn't really a, a big deal to work around. Um, <clears throat> that said, there, there are cases where you do need to pass data to an argument other than the first, and it'd be nice to be able to do that in a more convenient way than, than using anonymous functions. Um, <clears throat> again, LM is a, is a good example. You can do it with an anonymous function. So here's an example that I'll <clears throat> continue with, taking the old MT cars data, pick out cars that have four cylinders, and then fit a linear model of miles per gallon against displacement um, for that data set. Um, this works, again, it's visually noisy. You have, in addition to the anonymous function, you need these parentheses uh, in, in there to, to, to make it work, at least with the, with the current definition of the pipe. Um, <clears throat> we did, throughout the development for our 4.1, try and come up with something better, but Eventually, we just ran out of time. And we, we, we thought we had things, and testing showed that nah, didn't act. There were issues with it, um, so we had to stop and and just move on for that release. Um, once four point one was released, April last year, we had a chance to go back and and look at some of the things that we tried and and. Um, see if we could make them work a little better. Um, so uh, let's look at what you can do with McGritter. McGritter supports the as a placeholder. Um, so that little empty cars example can be written in this form where the LM call does not take the result of the previous step through the implicit first argument because that wouldn't work. Instead, it goes through the dot that is, is shown here with, with the, uh, as the data argument. That's fairly clean. Um, but there are some drawbacks, um, especially if you're working in something like the tidyverse where, where you've got mostly pipe friendly functions, you've got maybe 10 steps, and one of them is not doing the implicit first argument. Um, you want to be able to see that so you recognize, yeah, this one's different. With the McGritter approach and that placeholder, the only way you can see it is by spotting the dot, which is the smallest glyph you can possibly create. And for my eyesight, at least, it's not a good design. Um, so that's one, one issue. 
there's also a, a bit of trickiness that comes with the fact that the way Magritte works, it is possible to use that dot anywhere, including within sub-expressions and multiple times. Um, but the framework has to decide, is it going to basically support passing things through the dot or is it going to support putting so the dot only, I should say, or is it going to support putting that in putting the implicit first argument in. And the way it decides it is looks at the top level call. And if there's a dot in there, then it doesn't do the first argument uh, insertion, the implicit first argument pass. If there's no dot, it does. So artificial little example here, if I pipe with my gritter one into C, of a dot with dot as the in the, as a single argument, that dot means don't do the implicit first argument substitution, and we get just c of one. If instead of one I have something like dot plus one, instead of just dot I have dot plus one, that dot is not at top level. So when my gritter processes it, it substitutes the first. It inserts the first, the, the, it basically inserts another dot as the first argument. So one, and then it does the computation of the second argument. So people have written code that takes advantage of this. To me, at least, that's the kind of thing where you might feel very pleased with yourself for an hour or two and then. Three weeks later, you're really mad at the person who did this after you spent an hour trying to figure out what that code did. Um, so uh, we'd like to avoid these kind of issues a little bit. We tried a couple different things. Um, one approach that looked good initially was to use an anonymous function allow an anonymous function on the right-hand side, kind of like F-sharp or Julia do. Um, it's still a little wordy um, and visually noisy to handle that um, uh, linear model this way, but it does have an advantage of calling attention to the fact that this is not the simple implicit first argument approach. So you see it, it's, it you can't really miss it. Um, problem is that the way expressions are parsed, and we're fitting here a pipe operator into a fairly rich syntax that has things like defining a function and all that in it, things are not parsed in the way that you think they're going to be parsed when you're writing a pipe. Here's a little example. Um, artificial, but still. Suppose you wrote a pipe that takes a one, pipes it into a function that just adds one to it, and then assigns the result to a global variable y. If you're thinking pipes, that's probably what you think this expression means. It's not what it means, because the function binds more tightly than, than, the, than the pipe. And so what this really, it's not exactly the same, but this is essentially boils down to this. The, the assignment, the right assignment is part of the function body. So you're assigning a local variable in the function. So this is definitely not what you're trying to do. And this allowing this was just too risky and hard. You do run into exactly this issue with Julia. Now Julia doesn't, as far as I know, at least have a left, have a right assignment, but if you have, if you pipe through three anonymous functions with uh, the Julia pipe, those functions that are actually nested, and that means that their variables that they see are, are the ones, you know, local variables from the outer one, the first one, are seen by the body of the, of the third one. It's a source of possible confusion. Um, so, 
keeping in mind we wanted things to be visible um, and, and maybe be able to give a name to the variable, to, to the value that we're going to, uh, uh, the left-hand side value that we're going to use in non-standard location. Next thing we tried was basically as a, a special purpose function notation that, that parsed in the right way. Uh, so this in particular is what we implemented. The, the, the left-hand side can look like D, which is the variable, arrow, and then the body. Um, we actually had this implemented in 4.1, but not enabled by default. You could set an environment variable to, to use it. But the more we looked at it after the, the release of 4.1, the more clear it became that from a user point of view, this was just too much syntax for something very simple. Um, and maybe even more important, making this work in the parser involved a lot of changes. And the parser for R, it's already a pretty rich language. It was already complicated enough. We didn't want to go there and have to maintain those extra changes just for this purpose. So we backed off and after some experimenting, what we ended up with is a placeholder again, but we picked an underscore as something that is generally at least more visible than a dot. Um, because of the fact that we're still using a substitution approach, we don't want to allow it to be used more than once. So it's only once that it can be used. Otherwise, the left-hand side would be evaluated twice. Um, and to avoid the, those issues of using it in a sub-expression like the, the example I showed with, with the C function, we only explicitly only allow it in the top level. Um, one additional requirement we put in, at least for now, is that it has to be used as a named argument. Um, so the empty cars example using the underscore placeholder looks very much like the Magritte version. We're using the base pipe, and then instead of the dot, we have the underscore, which again, for me at least, is more visible. It's, it's natural to use it with a named argument in this case. Um, you don't have to do that with Magritte. You do have to do it with a base pipe. Um, so the underscore is more visible. Now that depends on fonts. Some fonts make it very thin, but most fonts that I've worked with, it's much more visible than the dot. Um, the requirement of a named argument also helps with the visibility. So again, you know, 10 steps, one of them is the non-standard one. It will stand out much more than just a dot. Um, also, essentially require basically forces it to be a top level argument. And for most people, it's easier to think about requiring to be named than is that top level. And if you think about parse trees, you can, yeah, you can figure out that if it's plus dot, what dot plus two is not top level. Or, and and, and uh, so you can do this kind of thing in current R. Um, and that means basically you can do almost everything that people do with, with, with McGregor. Um, so thinking of going forward, what, what, one of the things that's, that's come up um, in, in discussions on R to Bell is if you want, it might be nice to switch back to quickly to that example. Um, if at the end of this computation, you can put in a step that says, pull out just the coefficient vector. So do an extraction step. Um, how do you do that? Um, with the Magritter pipe, you can just add a stage that says, using the dot placeholder, dollar coef. Um, of course, you can also do this with back quotes in the dollar and then rely on 
implicit argument passing, but to me, this code is unreadable and, well, not unreadable, but it's harder to read and the whole point of pipes is to make things easier to read. So yes, you can do this, but this is what I would, this is what I would think of as, as the more natural way to do it. Um, doesn't work currently in our 4.2 with a base pipe because in this form, we're not using a named argument, uh, using the underscore as a named argument. And of course, with this syntax, there's no way of supplying the name. And the, name, the variable is called X in the documentation, but there's no way of doing X equals and then subset. Um, so a lot of the experimenting we've done on this, we've done in a branch in the SVN repository called R syntax. And this is a link to that, uh, that branch. Again, if we could make the slides available, um, uh, you'll be able to look at it there. Um, that branch currently supports um, doing exactly what I showed uh, using an underscore and then dollar and coef that works. Um, so based what we've made is an exception to the rule of, of having a requiring a named argument if it's the first argument to, if the underscore is the first argument to an extraction function. All right, now, having pulled out the coefficient vector, which is two components, we might want to next just pick only the slope. So what would seem natural to me is to be able to, in the um, base pipe, use, just stick in the double square bracket two to pick out that element, or in the McGritter case, um, uh, the same thing, just using a dot instead of the, uh, the underscore. This does not work in McGregor. Um, and you get, again, one of these slightly inscrutable uh, error messages because of what, what's happening under the hood. Um, you can, of course, pull out that second component by using another pipe stage, so something like this. So we pull out the coefficients by piping into dollar, and then we pull out the second element by piping into double square bracket. This seems awkward. Um, what we did in the that syntax branch is again to relax requirements a little bit to allow this to work in the more natural way. Um, so this is re relaxing the rule that the underscore has to be a top level argument. It can be something other than top level um, if it is the head of an extraction chain. I think that's the simplest way of describing this. Um, and so you could have a underscore dollar to pick out a component, pick out the third ele second element here. Maybe that's a list you could pick out something else with a dollar and so on, a chain like that will will work. Um, so that is what's supported now in that experimental branch. I'm hoping to move that into our devel in the next month-ish. Um, and that hopefully will give us a chance to uh, uh, to play around with it and, and see if there's any, any gotchas in it. Um, uh, okay. Uh, so that's that's what I'm expecting, hoping for uh, for the next uh, next release. Uh, let me start wrapping up. Um, R has a long history at this point, and the syntax itself goes back much further to the to the S language. Um, it does evolve. We have added new features um, to the language itself. Um, a lot of things you can add just to the language. Add to the ecosystem just using packages, even operators using the percent something percent uh, idea. Um, that's almost always a, a good place to start rather than this must go into base and please do it for me kind of thing. Um, a big advantage for those of us who are working on maintaining R and having things be in package spaces, we don't have to deal with it and support it. Somebody else has signed on to, to, to handling that. Um, it, it does mean that if you want to use such a feature, you have to have a dependency on some package and packages do become stale, maintainers move on and things like that. Um, 
So once something it's something is reasonably small and it becomes clear that it is widely used, is it worth at least having a conversation about whether it's something that should move into 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 base? Uh, doing that gives you greater stability and, and availability. But of course, a big cost is that the base maintainers have to take over maintenance um, and you know, there aren't that many of us and there's a lot to do. Um, if you decide you need a syntax change to make something happen, that is for something you cannot do in packages. Um, <clears throat> you, you can make a fork or something, but but that that will have to be done by by core developers, and it has to be done with a great deal of care. Um, the syntax is quite rich already. It is easy to have, come up with an idea that seems reasonable, but turns out to have some interactions you wouldn't really think through, like the bare uh, anonymous function as the right-hand side issue that, that, that um, it took a while to realize why that was not such a good idea. Um, so the forward pipe operator is something that as a, as a language feature in languages in general is, is newer than the base R syntax really. Um, so it's something that's come along Many languages have decided to adopt it, um, and um, it, it does seem like it's a reasonable choice to, to do that, uh, to bring it into the core of, of R as well. Um, the, the experience with, with McGritter showed it was a good idea. Having had that experience, we knew what was widely used and what features are maybe things we don't necessarily, you can still use the McGritter pipe, of the, you, can, you can use both pipes it's probably going to confuse you, uh, but you can use them together in, in one pipeline. But um, it seemed reasonable to, to bring in the core features. Um, we did it fairly slowly, fairly cautiously. Um, and that turns out, I think, to have been, been the right thing, especially since we're, we're working at, at the syntax level. Um, throughout the process, um, when something got into base, um, I think I usually sent an email saying, here's a change, try it out uh, through the Ardevel mailing list. Um, anytime you change base, there's going to be, especially syntax, there's going to be in some discussion, you might call it robust. Um, some people, th there'll be some contributions that are very well informed and very good. Others, well, maybe not quite so much. Um, in, in, in this case, uh, even though the discussion started on RDevel in most cases, it often spilled over into Twitter. Um, interestingly, at least surprisingly to me, some of the most useful contributions actually came through Twitter on, on this discussion. So it's been an interesting journey um, going, going down here. Um, but overall, I think it was the right thing to do to make this one change the base. And um, well, thanks, thanks for having me. Okay, we have time for some questions. Anyone? Uh, you said one of the things that makes it hard to uh, change the language a little bit is that the parser actually has to be adapted and that the compiler needs to take care of it. Is there any work being done on changing the whole compiler infrastructure to be more something like LLVM and like all the tools that are working with that? Um, for, the, for the most part, changing the parser doesn't, doesn't affect the compiler, the, the bytecode compiler as, as it is. It works off the parsed um, uh, data um, so you, you change the surface syntax as long as you're still parsing down to the same parse tree. Um, if you introduce a new basic operation, a new, a new primitive, and you want to play the primitive overhead in compiled code, then you have to change the compiler. But uh, for this in particular, nothing 
happened in the compiler and nothing, no changes were needed there. Um, it's certainly interesting to think about whether we want to have an ability of taking our essentially higher level bytecode and translating that to LLVM, um, but um, it's not clear that, it's certainly not something I'm actively working on. I'm not sure anybody is, um, um, it's just a matter of resources. I don't think we have them at the moment, but um, it is something I've thought about off and on, but it's not active, at least not on my part. Thank you, but um, my question, um, with the piping, it, you've demonstrated it to be more elegant than the other method. However, um, I noticed a cautious approach. Is that because of all the um, steps that you have to go through in order to get it into the base code, um, have it accepted by the compiler? Because I look at it that with the with what you presented, is that um, mm -hmm. it's nice to have the option of how you'd like to go with your code because some programmers like it one way versus another. Again, there's really nothing involved in the compilation. No compilation issue is involved. It's it's more it's more a matter of the the syntax. The R syntax is relatively complex. You've got a lot of different things going on there already. So if you add a, any kind of operator in syntax, you have to fit it somewhere in the uh, precedence level. And it's, it's easy to miss some interactions that end up being parsed differently than, than you expect. You know, the, I think the, the, the thing that was most, that, that bit us most, was most surprising was that thing that I showed with a bare function on the right-hand side. You, your mind is thinking you mean it to mean, you want it to, you want an exp sequence of expressions connected by pipes to mean one thing, but that's simply not the way it's parsed. And no compiler involved yet, it's just, how are these sequences of symbols interpreted by the parser? And they're just nested differently than you think when you're thinking pipes. And that, that's a risk when you're trying to add a different level of thinking about things into a system that already has a lot of complexity to it. Um, and so parser changes just need to be done with a, with a great deal of care. And it is, again, with something that's as rich as this, you're changing syntax and it's easy to get into situations where all of a sudden you can write things down that you think mean one thing, but they actually mean something else. Not compilation is really not an issue for, for, for these things, at least. Oh, this is going in a different direction, but uh, I, do, I do remember the day when a lot of uh, pure mathematicians used to speak in favor of um, developing functions using a uh, postfix uh, notation rather than a prefix. So instead of having uh, H of G of F of X, you would write that down as X, F, G, H. And that made it nice when you were going to draw lots of arrows showing the operation. So uh, I don't see us ever doing this now, but uh, it, it seems it would have made things a lot simpler. Yeah, you do start thinking about HP calculators and reverse Polish notation a little bit when you start looking at these sorts of things. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, there are, are uh, you know, there's some folks who think that the, I don't know, which we want to call traditional, the f of g of h thing, or h, which would have h of g of x is just natural, and why is it a problem? But um, others really prefer to get it into the order in which things happen, and that seems more natural. Um, 
uh, having removed the, the dot and replaced it with the underscore for the, uh, the placeholder for the, uh, um, the input, could, was there any consideration given to, to changing the, the pipe operator to a, a dot as in a, you know, a function chaining kind of notation? Uh, no, I think the, so many other languages had adopted that, that pipe, uh, you know, the, the vertical bar uh, greater than sign that, that it seemed reasonable to just stick with that. Uh, that is the symbol that's used by F sharp, by Java and, and uh, you know, a whole bunch of others. Um, it just seemed that, it didn't seem worth bucking that, that particular uh, uh, trend. So, um, yeah, so some people quibble with it for all sorts of reasons. On some keyboards, it's a little harder to type than other things. Um, but um, it didn't seem it didn't seem to make sense to go against what other folks have been doing on that one. Um, Luke, I'm slightly more on the purest end of the scale, I guess. Um, Whenever I see a pipe written, my first instinct is actually to write it as a series of nested function calls. Um, how easy is it to automate that? Um, you can turn your pipe into a string and running, run it through the parser, then it's, that's exactly what you get mm. um, if, if, if you really want to. I do, I do. <laughs> Um, just, just one more question for me. How much complexity do you think can be added beyond this? You know, I think the, as you said, the R syntax is already getting pretty complicated. Um, do you see additional features getting added at this point? I'm not sure. Um, there's certainly a number of different proposals. Um, if you go back to that that uh, um, uh, post by Lionel Henry that I and I linked to, he's he's got a few other things in there that seem not unreasonable, um, but um, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, they're one of the various kinds of annotations and things of that sort, whether it's type annotations or, or traits or properties and things like that have been suggested. And, and, and um, for most of them, there are alternatives. Um, you know, if you come from the Lisp world where I spent many years, you can always think in terms of just putting in a function call in the body of the function that, that gets interpreted. Um, so uh, I think there is, there are possibilities to adding more things, but I, I tried. I think you have to tread with caution, and it's 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 probably best to, to come up with things that you can do in packages first, and then only move to. Yeah, we really want to add new syntax. You absolutely have to. Um, I'm not great, and I don't think we have anybody who really is great at writing writing the the, the bison grammars. And anything we add at this point is probably going to need a, a lot of bison programming to get in there. So it better be worth the trouble if you're going to go there. It could be done, but. Um, do we have any further questions? Okay, well, if you'll join me thanking Luke again for an excellent talk. Sorry. Oh. Okay, so I guess we have a T-shirt drawer again. Um, uh, that is, can you read it? Because <laughs> I can't. Uh, 23E? Okay, there we are. Excellent. Come and see me at the end. Thanks. More. <laughs> <laughs> Put one in for Luke. Oh, I think you can.
can send him on anyway, can't you? <laughs> 25 here. Twenty-seven E. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. <laughs> one more, one more, one more. <laughs> Thanks very much. See you all next week, hopefully. Yeah. Thanks, Luke.